you all have a sermon outline to follow along in your bulletin with me today. Pastor T had already given us an introduction about our new sermon series, so I'm just going to give us a little bit of a review. We're going to meet insanity. Anybody ready for a new year? Anybody tired of the way your life was last year? Anybody ready for some new people in your house to be acting better? All right. (laughs) Sometimes you might have felt like you was insane, huh? (laughs) But tell me, if you look over at our big old sign over there, what is the name of our new sermon series? Praise God. 49 Days to Transformation. And we have a lot of materials that will be going along with this sermon series. So we want you all to be able to keep up. And we've helped you out with this card. Everyone should have this card. Take your card out and hold it up. This is your card. So you'll know everything that's happening over the next 49 days. On the darker side, the black side of the card, those are the weeks and the titles for each sermon message. On the white side of the card is our challenges and what we will be actually doing. So what does that say for week number one? Get devotional. devotional. All right. So Pastor Toby showed you the devotional. You have two choices. You have a small print, which is in the yellowy color, or the large print, which is in the larger white cover. Now, notice that this devotion has a huge number 49 on it, right? Why I say that is because you also have to pick up your Bible study guide. And it looks very similar to the large print, except it doesn't have the big 49. It's a smaller 49 on the front. So make sure you pay attention to pick up the correct um, information. Now, saints, we're asking that everyone get engaged. Say, get engaged. We want everyone to read the devotionals every day. And we also would like you to get involved in actually doing the Bible study. Now, I believe it's a list of all of the Bible study classes that we offer with addresses and all the information you may need. Now, I know some of you all are sitting there saying, but Pastor Kelly, even though y'all have all these dates, I still can't make it to Bible study. Well, can you take this packet home? All right. Well, we want you to do it at home. We want you to actually fill out the answers and do your lessons at home. You can work together as a family. You can call a friend, phone up a neighbor, whatever you got to do, but complete your Bible study lessons. We also will be having weekly challenges every day after the end of the sermon. Each of us will be given a weekly challenge to, to do throughout the week. And you may be saying, Pastor Kelly, why in the world do we have to do all of this? What's in it for me? Well, saints, what's the last word on the bottom of that sign? Transformation. Transformation. That's what's in it for all of us. We want to be new. We want to be different. So we all have to put in something to get something out, right? And we know the saying, the more you put in, the more you get out. The less you put in, the less you get out. So if you really want to get something out of this sermon series, we're asking you to do the devotions. Do the Bible studies, participate in the weekly challenges, and most of all, pray. I also want to tell you about this book called Not a Fan. It's by Kyle Eidelman, and it's another book that we've just been using for inspiration. So if you would like to just go deeper, you might want to pick up this book at your local bookstore or Amazon, wherever you all might purchase your reading material. All right, saints, so what is the title? Look at your card. What is the title of week one's message? Who is God? Why Jesus? Before we go further, let us take a moment to pray. Gracious God, we thank you, Lord, for who you are in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for already blessing us, for waking us up today, for allowing us to arrive here at this place of worship. And we're praying, Holy Spirit, that you would just open our eyes that we may see you, open our ears that we might clearly hear you, and most of all, open our hearts that we might receive you. And we thank you and we glorify your name. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And the people of God said, amen and amen. All right, first thing before we even get in the message today, I need you all to do me a favor and just shake your 
yourself awake. <laughs> Shake yourself awake. Get all the yawns out. Anybody need to yawn? Go ahead, get it out now. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> How many of y'all stayed out late last night? Oh, we got this whole crew over here. I, I, I might need y'all to go sit in the way back. Y'all might fall asleep. Y'all didn't get enough sleep last night. <laughs> How many of y'all went to bed on time last night? All right, good. So we are wide awake. <laughs> this is the second service. So wake up, saints. We are about to talk about God. Does that excite you at all? I mean, we're not just about to talk about some average old person here. We are talking about God. That in itself should get us some excitement, some pep in our step to make us want to get up and dance and sing because we are talking about God today. And do you know what, saints? I realize that when we talk about God, there are three different types of group of people that have an understanding about God. And we're going to try to find out today which group you might fall in. You see, the first group of people is the people who know about God. How you know if you're in this group is because you can answer questions like this. You might say, well, I go to church. Anybody like that? I hope y'all all in the building. <laughs> okay. I told y'all to wake up. <laughs> you might say, well, you know, my mom and daddy went to church. Anybody like that? Anybody can say, well, my grandparents went to church. Y'all know them stories, but grandma back in the day took you to church. <laughs> You might say, well, you know, I know somebody that go to church. <laughs> Some people that know about God are even so elevated, they might say, well, you know, I know the books of the Bible. Anybody know Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus? Okay, some of us. Some of us might say, well, I know a few bits of scripture. You know that one, like, um, for God so loved the world. I got that one down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Some might say, well, you know, I actually put something in that plate when it come around. You know, I put a couple nickels in that. All right, woo. We <laughs> Some might say, you know, well, I, I pray sometime. You know, when it's an emergency, that's me. When things get a little deep, I pray to something. I hope something happens. Well, you see, saints, do you realize that you can spend your whole life going to church Spend your whole life knowing people that go to church and know God. Spend your whole life even reading the Bible and studying the Bible, and you can still not know God. You can know all about God, but that doesn't mean you know God. So I don't know today. You might find yourself in that group, or you might know someone that falls into that group. The second group of people are people who don't know God and don't have a real desire to know God. Now, some of us in this room, if we confess, we were in that group at one time. Let me tell you how you might know if you're in that group. Because somebody that was a Christian came to you and started talking, and you did like this. Stop talking. I don't want to hear that nonsense. <laughs> you might have said, you know, when I get a little older, I'll get into the church. Or, you know, that, that really is not for me. I really don't have a belief in God. Anybody can confess today you might have been in that group every now and again. <laughs> Some of us who really know God now, we know what it was when we did not know God. And so we can easily confess that there was a time in our lives when we did not know God. And we had no desire to know God. Then there's the th third group of people, the people who truly do know God. I mean, really know God. I mean, not just know about God. They know God. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, what does it mean to truly know God? Well, you see, saints, knowledge about God goes much deeper than just mere, we know the books of the Bible and stuff like that. True knowledge, true knowing God means a, an intimacy with God. If we look at the book of Genesis, the first time that the word know is used in the Bible is when it says Adam knew his wife. I mean, that's deep, saints, that the Bible compares the church to be the bride of Christ. We are the wives. Now, I know that's kind of hard for you. Maybe, you know, some males might not necessarily want to be in the wife position sometimes. I don't know. But I'm talking about true intimacy, saints, when you know somebody so well that you know everything about them. I mean, think about this. If you have a spouse, you know what their hand feels like, right? I don't have to be near my husband to know how his hand feels in my hand. 
if you know your spouse, you know, like, how they feel, you know, when they rub your shoulder like that. If you know your spouse, you actually know what their voice sounds like. They don't even have to be around. You know their voice. You might even know their smell. Now, you might say, okay, Pastor Kelly, you're going just a little too far. What does the smells of a person have to do with anything? But you all know that baby smell, right? New baby come along, we always say, hmm, that's that nice baby smell. Well, we hope it's the nice baby smell. <laughs> But we know that smell. And just like you know your spouse or your loved ones, you know what they smell like because you're just that intimate with them. You know them so well. You see, the problem with intimacy, saints, is that we get it all mixed up with sex. We get sex all confused and all messed up, and then we sleeping with everybody under the sun. So we can't really understand true intimacy. What is it to truly know God? And you see, that's the kind of relationship that God is asking for all of us to be truly intimate with him. You know that song, there's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the presence of the Lord. Well, how did that person who wrote that song know that the Lord was sweet? That something about being in God's presence, it just smelled good. It smelled sweet. Only way you would know that is if you know God. You know God so personally that when God is in the room, you know God is present. You know what it feels like, what it sounds like, even what it smells like. It even changed the expressions on our face, amen? You see, God wants us to be so close to God that we truly understand what it is to know God. And I want you to know today, saints, that I'm not trying to sell God to you. I'm not trying to convince you to believe that there is a God. I'm not trying to convince you to give your heart to Christ right now. What I want us all to do is be able to answer the question, who is God? Who is God? What does that mean to be God? Well, you see, saints, we're going to be looking at who God is just with five words. Now, how many of you all, as soon as you see a big word, you just, your brain shut down? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some of us, we just like words. You just, you know, that paper, people just use big words. You're like, you didn't even have to use that, that word. <laughs> that was just all too big. You just want to be wordy. <laughs> some of us really like words. So I, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated when someone will throw a word out to and I'm like, I like the way you use that word in that sentence like that. <laughs> but I do realize that sometimes when we have too many words, people's brains just shut off and we stop listening. So I want us all to remember, wake up. <laughs> Tell your brain, wake up. Because <laughs> we're about to hit five big words today that describe God. Here's our first one. Immutable. Say that with me. Immutable. Immutable. What does it mean? God does not change. God does not change. Ever realize that everything about creation, everything that God created changes, but God does not change. We change. We go from being these little babies to being teenagers to being adults to being senior citizens. We change, but God does not change. God always stays the same. And guess what, saints? God's rules always stay the same. That's why when we get kind of wishy-washy and we don't know which way we should bend to and fro and we don't know if we should change this law or change this law, all we got to do is stay consistent with God. God's rules do not change about this world. God is what was that word again? And what does it mean? All right, so we all got that one word. Now four more to go, okay? Next one, God is? Which means? No end. All right. You see, saints, we all know that at some point in time, we began. Now, many of us think that was when we had our first breath into the world. But scripture tells us that we really began when God placed us in our mother's womb. We have a beginning. That point is our beginning. And we also know that we have an end someday, right? Now, most of us don't want to think about the end. We don't, you know, we get kind of fuzzy when we talk about way down there. But if it's one thing we all have in common, we will all face that end. 
And how we live this life will determine how we end and what happens when we get to the other side. Some people will get to the other side and say, oh, there really is a God. Man, I messed up. Some people will get to the other side and say, oh, I'm so glad I believe, Lord Jesus. I'm so glad. But you see, God does not, is not like us. God does not have a beginning when someone placed him in the mother's womb and, and he doesn't have an end. God is eternal, having always been. What else? What word was that? Eternal. What was the first word? Eternal. Second word? Oh, y'all so smart. What's the third word? Omnipresent. And it means God is everywhere. I mean, just think about this, saints. Right now, God is here present with us right now in Glenville New Life. God is also down the street at their church worshiping them. God is around the corner. God is on the corner standing outside with the people outside. God is way over at Calvary. He's in Cleveland. He's all throughout Ohio. And then he leaves Ohio and goes over to other nations. I mean, saints, God is everywhere. But you see, saints, for some reason, because we're limited, we don't think God can be everywhere. And most of us at times hope that God is not everywhere because we don't want God to see what we're doing. Well, saints, I got some bad news today. Those of you all that was doing what you was doing, he saw it. (laughs) He was there. He was right in your mix. And it's hard to think about that, saints, because I think about sometimes we are very private people. And and to think about God is everywhere. That means God is in my bedroom when I'm in my bed. That means God is in my closet when I'm trying to pick out something to wear. That means God is in the living room when I'm watching TV. Check this out. God is also in the bathroom when I'm taking a shower. God is also, you know, just excuse me, but he is also there when we're sitting on the toilet. (laughs) God is everywhere. And we can be embarrassed about that, saints, because we are uncomfortable with intimacy and we are sometimes uncomfortable with ourselves. But God who created us, he knows every part of us. He knows our inside out, our outside. And he's never ashamed of what he sees in us. He says, I love you. I created you. And so, yes, I'm going to come in the bathroom with you. Yes, I'm going to go outside with you. He's everywhere. I mean, saints, when we, when we, if we could just take our time and wrap our mind around it, that God is everywhere at all times. So what's our three words? Immutable? Number four. Omnipotent. That's a hard one. I kind of want to say omnipotent. <laughs> omnipotent. <laughs> and this means what? God is all powerful. And sometimes we as humans, we can kind of think, well, God must not have so much power because he's not helping me in my situation. He didn't save my family member from being hurt or, or, or death. So how can God have so much power when God didn't use it for me? Isn't that interesting that we think we can call upon God? the God of the universe, to use God's power when we command God to use it. I mean, God is looking at us and saying, when we say to God, God, you didn't use your power for me. God is saying back, where was you at when I was using my power to let you breathe today? Where was you at when I was using my power to help you out of that situation you was in that you shouldn't have been in? Where was you at when I was using my power to make sure the earth sat still in the universe and didn't move? Where was you at when, you know, I created all these stars in the heaven and and I told the ocean, be still and just wait right there and don't come onto the land? You see, saints, as much as we suffer and we have some hard times in our lives, God is always present with us. Knowing when we suffer and knowing how hard it is and always using his power. The hard thing for us to understand is we don't get to choose when God uses that power. Wouldn't that be nice, though? We could just say, hey, God, come on, do this for me right now. Drop down some money, a couple cars, you know, better relationship, better kids, better parents. (laughs) 
You know, I want to look a certain way. Help me out, Lord. But it just doesn't work like that. So we know God, y'all on the four. What's the four? God is immutable, eternal, omnipresent, omnipotent, and last one, omniscient. Woo! Glad y'all said that first. I waited. <laughs> omniscient, which means God knows everything. Now, I know some of y'all are really starting to sweat. <laughs> God knows everything. That means everything. I mean, sometimes I think of us as humans that we have the audacity to somehow believe that we are smarter now than anyone that came before us. We seem to think in our modern day age that we know how to do everything while those poor people back there just suffered in their misery. <laughs> you know, they had to live out in the desert. They didn't have no lights and, and stuff like we have. But you see, saints, it's amazing that God knows everything and God gives humans knowledge and God gave the people that came before us so much knowledge to build things that we still don't understand how they did it. Think about the pyramids over in Egypt. I mean, the, those pyramids have been standing for thousands of years. We can't even figure out how they got those bricks all the way up there. We say, well, they didn't have no big construction vehicles. They didn't have nothing special, no glue, no cement or anything like that. How did they do it? They did it because of the knowledge given them to, by God. I mean, we wonder how are we doing the things we are doing? I mean, do you just think every day somebody's sitting around thinking about how to invent a cell phone? <laughs> I know y'all young people think cell phones is always here. <laughs> they, they weren't always here. <laughs> But that knowledge had to come from some place. We as humans are just not good enough to make it come out of our brains on our own. God, who knows everything, provided the knowledge. So here's the final quiz. What's the five about God that we can know? God is eternal, omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient. Y'all got it. <laughs> Give your neighbor a high five. Say, you got it. You got it. <laughs> you see, God wants to be known. God is not trying to be some secret God that he doesn't want us to know about him or only wants a few of us to know about him. God wants to be known and not just known about. He wants to be known intimately. And you see, when you know God intimately, when you know that sweet, sweet spirit, Spirit, when you know the joy and the peace and the patience and the kindness that comes from knowing God, saints, it does something to you, saints. It makes you excited about knowing God. It gets you through those hard, difficult days that we sometimes can have. Saints, I want us to read this scripture from Isaiah chapter 45. And we're going to read verses 3 through 5. So that you may know that I am the Lord the God of Israel, who summons you by name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. I am the Lord, and there is no other apart from me. There is no God. The first part of that says, so that you may know. God wants us to know God. And not only does he want us to know that he's God and that he exists, he said, I want you to know I am the Lord. And I have a history with all of humanity, way back to Israel, way back to Jacob, and even before then. Then he tells us, he goes on and says, for, for I summon you by name. You see, sometimes I get y'all names messed up. Sometimes y'all get my name messed up. Y'all don't know who I am. But the Lord never gets us confused. He says, I summon you by name, and I bestow a title upon you of honor, of honor. Isn't that significant, saints? The rest of the world is defeating us and bringing us down and telling us we are worthless and nothing. And the Lord says, but I give you honor. And then he goes on to tell us, I do all this even though you don't acknowledge me. God is still God, whether we believe or not. God is still God whether we say there is a Lord or not. He says, I'm still going to be God for you even when you don't recognize me. 
Then he tells us, I am the Lord. And there is no other, no other. Apart from me, there is no God. See, that kind of clarifies the confusion when people are like, oh, there's many gods. There's lots of ways to gods. You know, there's this God and that God and this God. Oh, no, 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 no. God says, apart from me, there is no God. I am the only one. You see, saints, we sometimes get confused. We think about God and all what God is, what God does for us. We look at God and say, well, God created us. God heals us. God can provide us with finances. God can do all these things. But God is more than what God can do for us. In order to have a true understanding and a true knowledge of who God is, you see, you got to know Jesus. That's the important part here, saints. You can't say you know God if you don't know Jesus. It's kind of like, you know, just speaking in tongues, speaking all incorrect or something to say, oh, I know God, but I just don't believe in that Jesus right there. You see, saints, because there was something special that God did in the history of all of humanity when Jesus came into the world. You see, saints, sometimes we get kind of confused. But when Jesus came into the world, it was not just a son coming into the world. It was the incarnate God, the incarnation, one of those other big words. Here it is. God was saying, I'm not just going to save them. I'm going to put myself into the world on their behalf. You see, we kind of get confused sometimes, and we, you know, we get all, do we worship three gods, father, son, is that three? No. We worship one God who revealed himself in three different ways, through the Father, the Creator, the Son, the Savior, and through the Holy Spirit. One God revealed in three persons, saints. One God and when that guy said, look, y'all can't help yourselves. I'm going to come on down there and help y'all out. And he saved all of us. He changed history like no other. Check this out, saints. Before Christ, it was called B.C., right? Everything before Christ. Everything after that was after Christ, right? Now, I don't know about you, but I never saw no B.K., no before Kelly. I never saw a BT a before Toby. I never saw a BU a before you. It's before Christ and then everything after Christ. You have had to do something significant in this world that everything after you arrived has been defined by you. That's how meaningful Jesus Christ is. You see, if we look at this scripture today from Luke, let's read Luke together. It says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Think how deep this is, saints, that God would send Jesus into the world to enter into suffering. When he came into the world, he knew he was going to suffer. And that is why when we kind of say, Lord, you don't know how I feel. You don't know how it feels to suffer. You don't know how it feels to lose somebody. You don't know how it feels to be physically oppressed and beat down. You don't know how it feels. And the Lord is saying, um, excuse me, I am hanging on the cross. What do you mean I don't know how it feels? No other God, Muhammad, Buddha, none of them took a nail for any one of us, saints. Only Jesus took that suffering. When God said, I'm coming into the world to, so that I can experience everything that you're experiencing, he did not shy away from pain. God says, I'm coming into the world. I'm going to know what it's being to mean to be born, to live, and to die a tragic and suffering death. But then God took it one step further, saints, to have the experience that we have yet to have in the resurrection. That's the place we're trying to get to. You see, there is no other, no other like Jesus. And when God sent Jesus into the world, he says, I'm coming to free prisoners. I'm coming to restore sight to the blind. I'm coming to free the oppressed. And I'm coming to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
who does that, saints? None of us deserve that. You sitting down in prison, you know you did something wrong. You don't deserve for this, this God from heaven to come down and save you from prison. I mean, most of us, we, we think about those people that suffer with physical disabilities like blindness and deaf or, or legs or whatever it is, but we don't enter into their suffering. Here's Jesus coming and say, I'm coming to heal you. I'm coming to be a part of you. And then those that, that are oppressed. I mean, sometimes we think as black people, we got it bad. But it's always somebody that got it worse than us. And God is so concerned about us. He says, I'm coming to set the oppressed free. That you don't have to live in oppression anymore. Now, I know you're still sitting there saying, but Pastor Kelly, it is insane to believe in a God that I can't see, I can't hear, I can't touch. He don't seem to show up when I want him to show up. How do I believe in this God? Well, saints, my, my answer is to you, it seems to me that it's insane not to believe in God. It's insane to think some kind of way all this stuff just happened. It's insane to think some kind of way humanity, we created it all and we did it. That's what insanity is. Thinking we did something and we didn't do it. Saints, we're going into this new year, 2013. Some of y'all still trying to figure out how to write 2013 <laughs> like me. A new year, a new day. And you see, saints, we have to ask our question, do we want to be the same? Do you want to be the same old you that you were last year? Do you want to be the same old family that you were last year? Do you want to be the same church that you were last year? All right, then. You must be ready for some transformation. Transformation is hard work, though, saints. Requires something out of all of us, saints. And you see, next week, Pastor Rick is going to be preaching a message called, Who Am I? Who am I and why am I here? And you see, many of us struggle with knowing who God is because we don't know who we are. We're trying to figure out like we created ourselves or something. I did all this, y'all. I'm just that good. <laughs> but we have to under have an understanding of who we are that we would know who God is better. And so, saints, this is a true challenge for the next 49 days. For the next 49 days, just dive in deep. Don't question, you know, Lord, I'm not sure if I should do this. I don't know, that kind of sound kind of crazy. That church always doing something like that. Don't question, just dive in. Give it a try. 49 days is not a long time. And during the next 49 days, says our first challenge, the very first thing we're going to do as a church is that we're going to get up every day and we're going to acknowledge that there is a God. We're going to say this prayer. We're going to say, good morning, God. Say it with me. Good morning, God. I'm talking about as soon as you, you're still yawning, I mean, stretching, you ain't even moved a leg. You, you crack an eye. You know, you're trying to get the sleep out and stuff. You just crack it open. You say, good morning, God. First thing, good morning, God. And then after that, you say, what is your plan for us today? Say it with me. What is your plan for us today? Notice I didn't say, what is your plan for me today? You see, because this journey is not just about me. It's about you and God, the us. What is your plan for us today? And as you do this every single day for 49 days, every single day, watch the transformation that begins to take place in all of our lives. And over the next 49 days, we're going to commit to exploring the question, who is God? You see, because God, I said, wants all of us to know God. And ultimately, God is the one that will reveal God's self to you. And so every single day, ask your God, who are you? Good morning, God. What's your plan for us today? Commit to exploring the question, who is God and why Jesus? Let us pray. Hallelujah. Gracious God, you are so amazing and so mighty. And we just thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your power, for your might, that you are all places, that you know all things, Lord Jesus. 
Help us to understand, Lord, exactly who you are. Help us to be so intimate with you, Lord Jesus, that we know your sweet, sweet spirit in this place, gracious God. We're praying right now because we know that someone out there may still be struggling. Someone may still be saying, I just don't know. It sounds insane to do what they're asking me to do, Lord. But help them. Help us all to surrender to insanity for you, Lord Jesus. Help us to all be insane for you, Lord. To to tell the world and shout from the rooftops that we love you, Jesus. And we're not afraid to say it. Gracious God, we thank you for all that you're doing. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And the people of God said, amen and amen, saints. We're going to rise.